Okay, so he says over the Indian Ocean, a persistent bell-shaped distribution of low IR values can be seen mainly during the winter season along the area connecting North Madagascar and Sumatra. The lack of a similar distribution during the summer season indicates that the ITCD over the Indian Ocean changes its existence drastically from winter to summer. So people were not willing to believe that the ITCD migrates and you know comes over us in the summer because there were serious objections. Now this is a depiction by Webster in 87. I think it is in the book by Fine and Stephens that you find this. And what you see is, he has further, he has marked the region. You see, these are the winds converging into a region. And he calls M as the monsoonal regions and C as the IPCB regions, okay? So he also distinguishes between a monsoonal region and a typical IPCC region. So even Reel, and Reel was one of the more uh, deepest thinkers and most knowledgeable in tropical meteorology. But even he got, he changed his mind somewhere before seven, in the 70s. Because this I have taken from Reel's book on tropical meteorology 54. Okay, and this is from Reel book on I think climate and something in the tropics, 1979. And what you see here is the location of the equatorial trough in January and July. And what he has done is 80 degrees is the central longitude of India. So you see, from India onwards up to 120 east, he has drawn a blank here. He has not drawn shown it as an equatorial trough at all. For winter, it is continuous. Summer it is not. But by 79 he decided, no, no, it's the equatorial region that comes over it, which is very interesting. It shows evolution of thought in this case. Okay. Now what actually gave evidence 
that the second hypothesis is the one which is the reasonable one which gives the basic system for the monsoon was some work we did way back in 1980 and it was actually the first study which looked at daily variation of satellite imagery. You see, then satellite imagery had just become available. We did not have things like digital data, like outgoing long wave radiation, grid-wise, which you now readily download. That was not available. All we had was pictures. And so what we did is look at the pictures every day, for every day for five years. <laughs> and then <laughs> it didn't take five years, but five years data is what we have. And we looked at the variation of the satellite imagery over Indian longitudes and also variation of, from the weather maps, the variation of the trough at 700 millibar. See, 700 millibar has been known to be the center of the rainfall system by meteorologists, by Indian meteorologists. You see, if you go to the surface, I did not get into details here, but since there are some meteorologists here, let me tell you. If you look at the surface trough over India, then it is partly a dynamical trough, partly a trough associated with rain, but surface trough is also over heat low over, it's a heat low over Rajasthan, and that is not associated with cloud journey. So, if you simply look at surface trough, it can have ITCD or it may not, it may be a heat low. But if you go to 700 millibar, you know the heating doesn't extend up to 700 millibar unless there is deep ground. So 700 millibar ground is what meteorologists used to use as an indicator of where the rain belt is. So we also looked at data on 700 millibar ground, so that comes from the uh, ground observations and <coughs> showed that organized moist convection associated with the monsoon trough can be attributed to a continental ITCC over the region. In other words, the ITCC comes visit us, so we got continental ITCC because it is over the continent and we showed it. Now, how did we do it? First of all, we showed that in satellite imagery, the cloud band over the Indian region during the summer monsoon looks very similar to that associated with the classical ITCC that I showed you. So this is the summer uh, satellite imagery of an active monsoon day and what you see is a cloud band stretching right across, this is 80 degrees east, 70 degrees east, 80 degrees east, 90 degrees east. So it is again 10, 20, 40, 40, 50 uh, degrees, okay? So that is 5,000 kilometers across relatively less latitude than extent, only that the band over the west coast will be separate. So, first of all, if you look at it, in terms of looks, it looks pretty much like real classical picture, you know? Same kind of east-west band with intense crumbs. Of course, looks are not enough. And another example is the imagery, more recent imagery. This is 2007 and this is from an inside. And what you see here is another band here. But notice that very seldom is the band uniform in intensity. Okay? Very often there are synoptic scale systems embedded in the band. But you see definitely a large scale structure in which some places are brighter than others. Those are the synoptic scale systems. Okay? So day after day you see this kind of thing appearing. Now if we looked at equatorial Indian Ocean, before the monsoon, this is 16th of March, then you see the band is over the equator. Okay? So ITCD is over the equatorial Indian Ocean on 16th March, and a similar band is seen over the Indian region during the monsoon. In fact, the same picture that I showed you earlier, you know, in those days we had sector pictures and we had hemispheric pictures. And this is a hemispheric picture. I'm very sorry, it's not very clear. But this is India here. And this is the band that you saw an enlarged uh, picture of. And you see the same band is going right across here, and this is the Pacific. It is extending right across the East Pacific. So it is extending over half the uh, tropical atmosphere. You know? This again lends credence to the fact that it's the same element, same system. Okay, now, <coughs> but this is as far as looks are concerned, but dynamically we have to show that it is like the IPCC. So what are the distinguishing attributes of an intertropical conversion zone? See, intense conversions in the boundary layer is necessary. 
Now, you people have had exposure. I'm now not talking to people who have had formal meteorology. But in this course, have you been told about rotating systems and the Ekman layers and so on? You have. Very good. So the thing about rotating systems is that if you have cyclonic vorticity above the boundary layer, then you get convergence in the boundary layer and ascent. If you have anti-cyclonic vorticity, then you get descent. Okay? So cyclonic vorticity above the boundary layer, that is to say at 900 or 850 HPA is a must. It's a distinguishing attribute of ITCC. Okay? And it is a must. So you should have cyclonic vorticity above the boundary layer, deep convection and heavy precipitation. These are distinguishing attributes of the ITCC. And if you, now I mentioned that we took the 700 millibar drop and this shows why. This is the 700 millibar drop and this is the rainfall. Notice that if you took the surface, which I showed you a few slides ago, then the monsoon drop extends all the way from here to here with the lowest pressure occurring here over the heat flow region. But if you look at 700 millibar, over the heat flow region there is no low pressure at all. It extends only over wherever it is raining and this is the rainfall in July. So you can see 700 millibar in the mean is a good tracer of where the rain is occurring. That's the trough level you have to look at. Okay. And uh, this is the vertical velocity at 850 millibar, vertical velocity at 700 millibar. See, at 850 millibar, you are getting uh, positive, vertici uh, positive vertical velocity all over here. This is the at high movement. So even over heat flow, you are getting upward <coughs> movement because of the heat flow. But when you look at 700 millibar, then it is restricted to where the rain occurs. And this is the rainfall. Okay, so then what did we do? We looked at the following. Daily variation of what we call the maximum cloudiness zone, which is this. We looked at where it was at 70 degrees, 80 degrees and 90 degrees. So what we did at that longitude, we note the southern, southern limit of the band, northern limit of the band, in terms of latitude. This was done entirely subjectively by I. Okay, day after day. And MCG is taken to be that cloud band which has the maximum brightness which is predominantly zonal and has a longitudinal extent of at least 10 degrees. Now daily values of the latitudes of northern and southern limits and the axis of the MCG were adopted at these longitudes from the cloud mosaics for the period April to October 73 to 77. Okay. Latitudinal position of the 700 millibar drop at these longitudes was obtained from the daily weather charts prepared by Pune Weather Center. 700 HPA level were chosen so that the heat trough at lower levels was not included. See, we are looking at the, the trough which is associated with rain and excluding the heat trough. So what did we find? What we found was the following. Now what this shows is that 80 degrees east and 90, remember 90 east is the Calcutta is and 80 is can be considered central longitude of India. This is simply the number of days on which this cloud was present at that, in, at that particular latitude, going April, May, June, July, August, September, October. What you see for in July, August at 80 and 90 is that the distribution is bimodal. You see, you see a lot of uh, frequency, high frequency in this band, relatively less frequency around 7 north or so, and then again peak here. So this is saying there are two TCGs, two tropical conversion zones over our region, not necessarily simultaneously. Mind you, this is a monthly picture, so it is adding on the daily pictures. But that this is saying that there are two favorable, zo favorable zones for occurrence of the TCG, ITCG. One over the north, heated subcontinent in the north, and one over the equatorial region. Note that we have started only from zero and not gone to the southern hemisphere because that is the kind of data we had. We had northern hemispheric uh, pictures and southern hemispheric pictures. So we stopped at the equator. So this was one of the results that there are two favorable locations for the cloud bands, one over the heaters of continent and another over the warm waters of the equatorial Indian Ocean. 
Now the low frequency belt between 7 and 13 north which separates the northern MCG from the southern one. Now we took the minimum occurrence along these to be the separation. Okay? So we actually had data for the southern or the equatorial TCG as well as the continental ITCG. Now, so you see how we have separated the two, then we can plot the mean positions and one is for 80 and one is for 90, but it doesn't matter. <coughs> so what this is, the, how the latitude of that axis of the band changes. This is monthly average. So you see a migration here, clear migration of the band. So the band that became continental was located here earlier, in April, May, in the equatorial region. Then it migrated north and then it retreated southward. Okay? And the oceanic band persists throughout June to September. So there are two bands, two favorable locations. And this is the seasonal migration you see of the IPCC, which gives us the monsoon. Okay. The most prominent, this is one point. And the most prominent feature of the daily variation of MCG is a series of northward propagations. And this is the original figure from the Sikha Library paper. And what it is, it is only at 90 degrees. And these are five years, 73, 74, 75, 76, 77. Okay? This dash line, it's a confusing picture, but I think you will get a sense of how confusing the data can be and still you see a pattern. What you see very clearly is that there are these very nice propagations that are occur year after year. You see that? Year after year, there are northward propagations. Here again, here again, here again. So every year, there are northward propagations from the equatorial region to the region where the monsoon zone is. And <coughs> this, of course, furthermore, and I don't want to belabor the point here, but we could also see that the 700 millibar trough also shows northward propagations. That is to say that the MCG or the maximum cloudiness zone that we have delineated from the satellite picture is in fact associated with the 700 millibar drop, which means it's associated with the rain belt. Okay? And this is a simpler picture than the one we originally had. And this is showing just the cloud band. And since it is simpler, the same data, but simpler picture, this is the cloud band, and you see these northward propagations. And you see that this is 70, 80, and 90. So the, there is a coherence in the movements also. So the band is coherent across the Indian longitude. It's not as if it's one synoptic blob moving northward. It is the whole band moving northward. And from year to year, now 74 was a very poor monsoon, 75 was a good one, 73 was a good one. But northward propagations occur irrespective of whether it's a drought or a good monsoon or a bad monsoon. Okay? It is an inherent feature of the system. And okay. So what have we concluded? That the MCG associated with an active monsoon day resembles that associated with the canonical ITCC. MCG over the Indian region is associated with cyclonic vorticity at 850 and 700 HPA. And I'm sorry, I think I forgot to put the picture of that, but it doesn't matter. And there is a high correlation between the axis of MCG and that of the 700 HPA trough, which is known to be associated with intense conversion in the lower troposphere and maximum non holographic rainfall. So this was shown. So putting all this together, we concluded that it becomes clear that the organized moist convection associated with the monsoon may be attributed to continental IPCG over the region. This sunlight is consistent with the characteristics of an IPCG, namely presence of a prominent zonally oriented region of moist convection in the tropics associated with high cyclonic gravity vorticity and convergence. Thus, monsoon MCG may be considered as a manifestation of a continental IPCG and the secondary MCG of an oceanic IPCG. So we said that there are two in intertropical convergence zones over our longitudes. And <coughs> okay, this is the picture I wanted to show you earlier. I'm glad it's there. 
this is, you remember this picture of the, this, for the same day, when you see this band across about 20 north or so, this is the MCG or the maximum cloudiness zone. For the same day, you see these are the weather charts. And this is 850 millibar. And you see, just under the band, you see high cyclonic vorticity. Because you see, this is the winds are going this way here and this way here. High cyclonic shear vorticity. And then there are also blobs, vortices here. 700, you see, and the drop is almost vertical. 700, 300 by 200, of course, it has disappeared. So you have a very deep cyclonic vorticity system associated with it. Now, this is the distinguishing attribute of an IPCC. So, in fact, <coughs> So the MCG is associated with intense cyclonic vorticity at 850 and 700, and note the presence of synoptic cell systems, and northward propagations often involve propagation of synoptic systems over Arabian Sea and Bay of Bengal, which get connected as a zonal band. So these synoptic things are part of the story always. Thus the, so what can we conclude? We can conclude that the monsoon is a manifestation of the response to the seasonal variation in the radiation from the sun, and it is the seasonal migration of the ITCG. Now, <clears throat> before I go to Blandford, now can somebody tell me what is the answer to Murakami's problem? That the latitudinal extent of the low OLR region or the cloudy region over the Indian longitudes was very, very high, you remember? And why is it high? See, we have shown that it is an ITCG garden variety, right? All the attributes are met of the classical ITCG. Then why is the latitudinal extent of OLR on the monthly scale so large? It's not stationary. Pardon? It's not stationary only. Absolutely. It is the fact that it has two modes, primary and secondary, and it moves. So when you look at monthly, you will get low OLR over that entire region where it's generated and propagated. So unless you knew about the intraseasonal variation, you would not have been able to answer the question about the monthly or seasonal distribution in this case. So intraseasonal variations are very important in this region. And this is a feature, northward propagation, which is a special feature of our region. Okay. So now we are saying that the monsoon is a, my, is a manifestation of the seasonal migration of the ITCG in response to the seasonal variation in the sun, okay? And I was very much intri intrigued to find that Blanford first suggested this in 1886. Now, <coughs> that the monsoon is associated with the occurrence of, the, of a system which is seen over the equatorial Indian Ocean in the spring. That's the way he put it, okay? He was way before Reel or Charlie or anybody. It was 1886. He didn't know about ITCC or equatorial trout. But he said the same system. You remember I showed you a picture of the ITCC in the spring when it occurs in the equatorial Indian Ocean. So same thing uh, is uh, seen. And this is a classic for those of you who are interested in monsoons and interested in meteorology, it is a must read. It is a, now available even on the, uh, as a soft copy from the IMD website. And it's a treasure house of ideas and a very, very interesting analysis of all kinds. I think he was a giant amongst the scientists. So what does he say? And <laughs> it is a, actually very lucid English. Old style, Victorian, I guess. During these spring months, on the Bay of Bengal and Arabian Sea, the winds are light, frequently alternating with calms and somewhat variable. Now he is talking of the pre monsoon, April, May. Okay? The change that ensues at the end of May or in June, when the surrounding seas are swept by a strong monsoon current and heavy and continued rain sets in on the coast of India, is very marked and has long been recognized in the popular language as the burst of the monsoon. The essential cause of the change appears to be that during the spring months, the sea winds which feed the storms of that season 
are the relatively damp but by no means saturated air of the surrounding sea or if saturated, at least not so to any considerable vertical height above the surface. Okay? So he is now talking of spring winds. In spring, the winds are not very moist above a certain level, is what he is saying. But in more southerly latitudes, now, so first he talks of what happens in April, May over our latitude. But over in more southerly latitudes, in the neighborhood of the equator, is a belt of the atmosphere corresponding to the doldrums of the Atlantic, into which the southeast states of the South Indian Ocean pour a steady supply of almost saturated air. At all times of the year, more or less convection goes on in this belt. See, this is what we also saw, that there is that region remains favorable for having a rain belt or having an IPCC. This is what we refer to the, as the IPCC or the equatorial trough. As proved by its raininess in all the seasons, and consequently it affords a great reservoir of air, which up to an infinite height above the surface, borders at all times on a state of saturation. <laughs> you know, that's the way he has put it. So here, before the monsoon in spring months, you have relatively shallow moisture, but to the south over the equatorial region, you have this enormously deep convective system, into which is moist air from the southern hemisphere is pouring in. This is his description. Okay, now it appears, now it appears to be the eventual rush of this air towards the region of low pressure, developed over India gradually during the spring months, that constitutes the burst of the monsoon. See, everybody knows that India gets hotter and hotter in the spring months, right? Now he says, eventual rush of this air towards this region of low pressure, developed over India gradually during the spring months, that constitutes the burst of the monsoon. Once started, the energy of its movement is sustained by the condensation of its own copious vapor by the latent heat so set, so, so set free. Okay? This is the way he envisages the system. And he's so close to what we find now that it is amazing. He says the energy of convection furnished by the heated atmosphere of the plains is competent only to keep up the feebler in drought that obtains during the spring months. See, during spring months, the land is very hot. And you get a very feeble, feeble end drought. And he says, that's all it is, uh, that's all land ocean contrast can do. Get this feeble winds. And indeed, even this end drought is maintained partly by the moderate condensation of cumulus and local thunderstorm fed by the vapor it drinks. So even in pre-monsoon, you know, it is the latent heat that drives them. The solar heat directly absorbed by the dry land atmosphere or taken up from the heated ground bears much the same relation to the general air movement as the pull of the electrical dust to the propulsion of the rifle ball. It determines the disturbance of atmospheric equilibrium, but it does not furnish the energy of the resulting air stream. That energy is supplied in the latent heat of the indrawn vapor. See, this is a very beautiful way of putting it. Everybody has been harping on land ocean contract. He says it plays the role only of a trigger. So long as this supply is small and limited to the shallow stratum of air immediately fed by the evaporating surface beneath it, so long is the air movement feeble and interrupted. Okay, this is the spring situation. And it is only when the barometric gradient from the south to north has become sufficiently great to tap the great reservoir of latent energy supplied by the evaporation of the southeast trade zone that the air current becomes strong and sustained constituting the summer monsoon. Sustained too, long after the heated land surface has been in a great measure quenched and cooled by the rainfall. Okay? This is in fact very much what we understand as a monsoon today. And he had the insight, he had only 15 years of data. No data on oceans. But whatever data on oceans was by ships. You know, no satellites in that way. And yet, he has deduced correctly what is the basic system responsible for the monsoon. It is amazing. And it took a, the satellite before we could actually do it conclusively. So thus, more than 125 years ago, Blanford had first suggested that the Indian summer monsoon is associated with the appearance over the Indian region of the tropical convergence zone from the equatorial Indian Ocean. 
Now I use the term tropical convergence zone because if you have two two convergence zone over the same longitudinal band, the convergence in both is not intertropical, right? Intertropical means it should come from two hemispheres. <laughs> Obviously, for the northern one, it's not doing it, right? So instead of worrying about where the convergence comes from, we just talk of a tropical convergence. So, so it was more than 125 years ago that Lanford had first suggested that the Indian summer monsoon is associated with the appearance over the Indian region of the TCD from the equatorial Indian Ocean. It is surprising that neither Simpson nor the following generations of meteorologists, including Webster, Meal, and so on, these are the monsoon meteorologists that we all hear of now, took note of this hypothesis by Blanford, which I believe was also conceived independently by Reed and Charney in the late 70s. They also realized this. Not of Sikhan Gandhi's proof of the validity of this hypothesis. So nobody understands the implications of what we did also. And to this day, we teach Harry's theory of the monsoon as a gigantic land sea breeze. So this is why I wanted to share this with you. It is very interesting to see the evolution of ideas and how it has not been a monotone progress by any means. Blanford was way ahead of his time. And then we went back and forth. See, Blanford came after Haley and Hadley. But he had realized what the thing was because, and then Simpson realized it was not land ocean part that they were doing. But still he did not understand what, he did not tell what was Blanford. And later on people see, again are going back to land ocean contrast. And this uh, planetary scale land sea breeze theory of the monsoon. So this is where theories of the monsoon stand today. I think we have fairly good evidence that this is a very, this is in fact what we experience as the monsoon is the seasonal migration of the tropical convergence zone over us. Land ocean contrast plays a role in determining how far north it goes, okay? But that's about it. So over the oceans, what happens is that the SST maximum doesn't go that far north in the summer. So the ITCG also doesn't move that far north. Of course, over ocean things are more complicated because sea surface temperature depends not only on the incoming radiation, but also on sea, ocean currents and so on and so forth. So the, it's more complicated. So land, land heating, elevated uh, heat source and so on play a role in determining the latitude to which the ITCG will go. But the ITCG would not have gone as far north as it goes up to monsoon zone, were it not for the very special uh, geographical uh, features of the Indian region, the shape. The shape that allows northward propagation with one cloud sitting over the warm Arabian Sea, another cloud cloud sitting over the bay, and both of them moving northward. You see, northward propagations are sustained because we have these two warm oceans over our longitudes. And that is what makes it possible for it to move that far north. But uh, this then is the theory of the monsoon, which I believe, and which I believe we have proved uh, conclusively. So now I'm going to go over to monsoon and climate change. If there are any questions over this, I would like to take them now. Everything is crystal clear? Yes? Mm. Yeah, right. In fact, if you see my NPTEL lecture, I have tried to look at all this in detail. Tried to, from the recent re analysis data, look at regions over which there is a particular center and so on. See, part of the problem is over the Americas, the ITCP doesn't propagate so far southward or northward. And because of that, you don't have such a large region of seasonal direction of wind changing. Okay, and Ramage was held by the wind. <laughs> Most of the people thought, no, no, we must have. So Ramage in his book actually gives the idea of what is the monsoonal region in terms of how much should be the difference between the direction in the summer and winter and consist persistence of the wind and so on. But if you look at the IPCC, actually South America is also a monsoonal. 
If you look at the convention, if you look at the circulation, it also has a deep circulation like that. Asian monsoon certainly has, Australian monsoon has, but Australia is not the periphery of the world. You know, it is only over Asia that it comes and sits on us, the tropical temperature and so on. But, uh, you know, monsoon is proved to be such a millstone. Everywhere in the world, because we have billions of us, people can get funding if they can relate whatever they want to do to the monsoon. So, North America also wanted a monsoon. And so they are great to <laughs> So now there is a North American monsoon, there are papers on it and so on and so forth. But if you go to this stringent criteria, that by monsoon we mean migration of a system, which is sort of like the ascending limb of the head, we said, you know, with ascent toward the troposphere, then North America is not a monsoon region. And if you go to my entire lecture, then I have looked at all this in great detail and actually shown what is the vertical structure of the circulation over different parts. So, there if I may say, there is never a definition of what is a monsoon based on the vertical structure. North America doesn't qualify. But then anyway, they have called it a monsoon. Um, yeah. I think I read somewhere that monsoon was established 8 million years ago. So, uh, and that time they related it to the rising of Tibet in uh, that. So, like, according to this theory, uh, what would be the negative factor? Uh, for no, no, actually, you are absolutely right. The fact that we have an elevated plateau does play a role, elevated new source. So, as I said, no, after So, you have a negligence. If you have, you have a bed going right around the earth, say, in the equator, okay? And it gets pulled northward in another side. Now, how far it gets pulled northward depends on many factors. And if it were not for the Tibetan plateau, perhaps it may not have been pulled much beyond Bangalore. Okay? So Tibetan plateau will be the best there in what it was. But the whole problem is none of the present models are getting the rainfall distribution of monsoon right. If they were getting it right, then we would chop up the plateau and see what happens. In the modern you can do all these exercises. Or you could put another thing at the world in Africa and see what happens with us. Now, right now, the African monsoon goes on here for 10 now. Indian monsoon goes on for 22, 23, right? So we have to see. Uh, but certainly, the wet and light ocean contrast is not play a role. But they play a role in determining the maximum latitude of the planet and uh, not in terms of uh, the system per se. How far they can pull the system up? Why does the lag between the movement of IPCs and solar insulation? That's because you see, now I didn't have time to go into this, but uh, you are having a huge system, right? And they have to set up the circulation. The sun may have moved, but initially the IPCs is to the south, right? And the, while the sun moves, it is never in equilibrium with that. Because there is a lag, there is a whole development of the system involved. See, the atmospheric system involves this rising of air and deep clouds and so on and so forth, right? It cannot see, it is not attached to the solar TV. Eventually it gets there. But there is bound to be a lag. Simply because it is a response of a very complex and a large scale system. In fact, I would have been surprised if it was instantaneous. But this lag changes every year because the onset also changes every year, like many years. No, the lag doesn't change too much. There, the lag that you saw in real picture, that is the overall lag average over all the entire earth, all, all the longitude. That is more or less two months. Okay? Now, what you are saying is the length of the rain in the season changes every year. Very good. Because the onset rate changes, the longitude rate changes, and so on. But actually, the length of the rainy season does not seem to have that much impact on the actual recording the rain. In fact, in the, again in those lectures I have shown that uh, the correlation between high all in a month will be for high summer and onset of the other is very poor. In fact, you get a better correlation between how long it takes to advance from the other and the other. 
the earlier the advance, the more likely it is. So, but nothing is very clear. Yeah? Yes? <laughs> okay. Now, uh, <laughs> I tell you why I said it. Because I have met many people who believe. Now, what have we seen? We have seen that there is a bad love of them, zonal belt, and that moves northward, and that is the monsoon. Now, in October, November, if you see, the, you again see a very similar picture. The IT city, but it's on the south. So it's around 30 north or so, and then 10 north, and slowly, slowly, it will so, what do we see? We see the same system on the monthly scale moving northward and then retreating. Okay? But on the daily scale, interestingly enough, it doesn't move southward at all. What happens is, I didn't bring the picture here because that was too much money. But what happens is that <laughs> during the onset wave, throughout the month of say, throughout April to October, banks are getting generated in the equatorial. And they move now. But the northern limit changes. So from June to July to August, it goes farther and farther northward. And in the retreating phase, again banks get generated and they go farther and further southward. So the onward of sort of goes northward and southward. But it is made up of only northward movement. That is the natural uh, basic feature of this system, that you have northward movement. So what have we learned? That the same system gives us rain whether it is October, November or June or something, right? Now, by calling it one southwest monsoon, another northeast monsoon, it gives people the impression that the system is different. And I met a lot of lay people who think that southwest means the rains come from the southwest, and northeast means the rains come from the northwest, which is not at all true. During southwest monsoon, the wind is from the northeast, not from the monsoon truck. So north of the monsoon cloud, you can say it is northeast monsoon. South, you can say it is southwest. So it is foolish to call seasons by giving them the name of the winter. So this is why I think it's a misnomer. And once you go to summer monsoon and post monsoon, summer monsoon is June to September and post monsoon is October, November, December, according to the IM definition. And it is because I met people who thought actually the rain came from southwest that I thought that this has to be changed. Okay, are you people ready for climate change? Yes. Madam, <laughs> I heard that it is a northward propagation of elephants. They they uh, run the big spells of the and and convert to the elephants is not very pretty. So, uh, but once you said that there is no proper propagation between maybe in the strong or small big ones that this one propagation. So what is the no correlation between what and what? Is propagation and I tell you. Now, all, there are two ways. You are, of course, asking questions of things I have not covered, but that's perfectly fine. Break is an intense form of weak spell, okay? And breaks occur at any time during the week. But let us look at weak spell. Suppose, suppose the city city of the cloud where the whole system disappears from the monsoon, okay, for a few days. In fact, if you read the original Sikha Guide paper, we have written a lot about this in that. So, <coughs> Now, how does the monsoon revive after the day, or after the generally weak spell is that? One mechanism is the northward propagation. But equally frequent is the revival by some system forming in the head bay, synoptic scale system, and moving across the monsoon. So there are two modes of revival from lakes. One is northward propagation, and one is propagation of system generated within that latitudinal line. Sometimes these systems in the head bay come from uh, the West Pacific coast. You know, they come right across and then go get intensified over the bay and then move across the monsoon. So there are two modes of revival of the monsoon. But I must also tell you that this northward propagation is a basic feature of the monsoon. Okay? So it occurs year after year. That's why I showed you droughts are good also. Northward propagation is always up. So it is it is a feature that is an invariant feature in a way. It does vary from year to year, but there are some years, like the drought of 72, in which the successive northward propagation, uh, in between them, there was a bigger spell, six weeks. But if you look at other drought like 79, you have classic northward propagation. What happened is it never got uh, sustained by these 
restored propagating mode. So it is complicated, and therefore, you, you know, one can't think every feature of the monsoon to drops and good monsoon, that's what it is. And that is why I think we're going on and on about NGO and so on. You are not going to see much more here. Because it's okay. NGO is there, NGO is another way of looking at the northward propagating bands. But northward propagations occur at two to six weeks in the you know, it's not a 30 to 50 day simple harmonic oscillation as in years would have us believe. It's not right. It's very, very complex. Well, Ma'am, is there a difference of the breaks that the uh, moisture supply from motion is stopped or is it something like this? See, uh, you, sh you should see that even oceanic ITC uh, has breaks. If you look at just clouds, there are specs in which the sky is absent for few days and it revives. So it has nothing to do with the moisture supply on the surface because when the ocean it is always very high. So what happens is there are feedbacks of the system itself. Now how does the ITCP sustain itself? It sustains itself because of the latent heat generated, there is wind opposite heat. Okay? But all this occurs because there is a vertical instability, right? Atmosphere is unstable to ascent of moisture and stable to ascent of climate. Now, <clears throat> what does that instability depend on? That depends on the temperature profile, right? And <laughs> what happens when you have mean tropospheric heating? You are eating into that instability. That temperature profile is becoming less sharp. Okay? So you are eating, you are eating, you know, like feeding the hand that feeds you. If that happens, then the instability disappears. And once the instability disappears, you can't approach. So this is a free basis, negative feedback. And Krishna Murti and Bhagavad first showed that this big tropospheric feeding can have such an impact. So the system is full of this instability. And given the instability, you do not expect it to be there day after day. There may be internal feedbacks. Same thing can happen when it moves over land, there are land surface processes that come in. Right? Initially, when it moves over land, where after a lot of rain has occurred, in fact, this is also what we mentioned in our paper in 1980, that what happens is you get typically very sunny, you get a nice northward slope. Then, by July, it is established over the month. Within the first two weeks, sometimes you get a weak spell. But at that time, if the continent is so moist, it's like an ocean surface. It revives it. Okay, it may have disappeared simply because it ate up the vertical instability of the And it is able to do that. But if such a big spell occurs at the end of a month or so, all the water has drained out from land, right? It is not like a lake anymore. Then it cannot revive this. Then revival has to occur just like in the onset. You know, in the onset phase to begin with, we had a dry atmosphere that to the north, right? Dry conditions over India. And then this battle came out. So similar things occur when you have a break in about one month at the end of the from one month after its death. That is why in the last week of July, almost year after year, you see a very neat number of And sometimes the thing is not downwards, but still you see very clean number propagation year after year almost, in the last week of July. But I must mention to you that there was an <laughs> experiment for the um, CPCC to try and understand the tropical conversion and so under the Indian climate research program. And professor, uh, one of the major objectives was to study the mechanism of number propagation. So we had one ship around 30 in north, another near the head. Okay? And professor, what was the ship there? <laughs> And the data showed until that year <laughs> that every year propagations are the exception turned out to be the year when they were in the sea waiting for the propagation. And I think they had to give around 10 of hours, and that's when the propagation occurred. It did occur. It's not that it failed, but it completely made foods of us. So the of us were turned out of that. So this is a problem. Remember, it's a complex system with a lot of feedbacks, a lot of interaction. And for such system, you cannot predict it because they are not a stable linear systems. So nobody wants to go on to climate change or what? Come, huh? 
There was somebody here who is looking at ice ages and so on, right? So that is the most interesting uh, climate change, but that's not the focus of these kind of studies. Generally, it is man-made, anthropogenic factors that are involved. Now, the impact of the climate change bandwagon on the community has been so large that in some circles, climate has become synonymous with anthropogenic climate change. However, for many parts of the world, especially in the case of precipitation, climate change is a relatively small part of the climate we have experienced up to date. This you have to keep in mind. Climate change in terms of amplitude is much smaller than climate variability that we experience and is going to take a long time to come in temporal scale also. This has to be kept in mind. Now, this is the estimated percent of variance of the 20th century observed precipitation 
annual mean ascribed to the nonlinear trend. Okay, this is the trend of obtained from global warming and so on. This is from Mars. And what you see, this is India. Well, it is about zero to ten percent. This is the estimated percent of variance of the observed precipitation. So it is going to be rather small percent of the observed variance. This has to be kept in the back of your mind. When you look at climate change scenarios, you are looking at a very small component of the variance. Okay. Now, we know that the climate change due to anthropogenic factors is predicted using climate models. For the Indian monsoon, the skill of these models in simulating present-day climate variability is rather poor. And there is a paper by Ravi Nanjundaya and Rajivan in which what they have done is to analyze the IPCC AR4 climate models and see how good are the best 10 models, best 10 in terms of correlation between observed and predicted and so on. I mean of the pattern, mean also. Okay, so this is the observed GPCP climatology and you see here, this is the monsoon zone here, okay. High rain here, and you have the western country right here, west coast right here. So this is climatology, and notice that the eastern Indian Ocean, equatorial Indian Ocean, if you look at east part rains, west part doesn't rain. Okay, these are observations. Now, how are the models doing? You can see it now. <laughs> this is a GMDL model. It's not too bad. It's getting a kind of IPCC here. Hardly extend in here, right? And you can see what I have done is cut and pasted the GPCP here, okay? So by and large, GFDL seems okay here, but the equatorial IPC is very, very intense. They are getting both the most. But if you go to GFDL second version, this is dominating this. You see, we also showed in that Sikhara study that because you have two tropical convergence zones in the same longitude, they compete with one another. If one becomes intense due to the substance, it can suppress the other one. So there is a competition between the two. It went to the second one. Okay. Yeah. So there is a competition between the two, and uh, here you are getting a more intense oceanic IPC than this. This is the second GFDL model. CNRM looks very peculiar. And look at this one. This one has a huge hole over most of the region. It's raining primarily only in the eastern region. You can do it. See the comparison with the observed there. Now this is another set of models. All models are respectable models. Maybe. And see, this is, look at this. This CCSL3 is raining so much over Arabian Sea and so on, which is not at all true. And uh, NPI is another very peculiar structure with a north south band of rain. I don't understand it. And this is CCSM, I'm sorry, PC, PCM, which is raining only over the ocean and nothing over India almost except the eastern part. So these are not small error, as you can see. The models are pretty bad. And uh, so this is image, this is a high resolution model uh, which does much better. This is a Japanese one. And which does much better over India, but look what it is getting over, you can see. And no rain at all over eastern equator in India. No. And look at this character, Jis. <laughs> it's raining only over that equator in You see? It's almost like orographic rain there. And you have. <laughs> Nothing over the equatorial region of the So, this is just to show you how bad they are. And <clears throat> these figures are from Professor J. Srinivasan. See, when you try and see how good is the annual cycle by the model. Well, they all get some annual cycle, but that's about all you can see. See, this is the observation. And you can see many more. They are getting somewhat, but look at this model. It's okay, there is a huge scatter. Huh? So they get some annual cycle, but this is again IPCC AR4, huh? uh, not the latest one. 
And so you say, well, my, many models are, now what is, what is this? This is difference in rainfall future minus 20th century climate. Future means 720 ppm CO2. And future, the, what it is saying is, see, this is April, May. So June to September, there are many models which are showing an increase. <laughs> but several models are showing a decrease, okay? So while many models predict an increase in the monsoon rainfall, a significant fraction predicts a decrease. Okay. Now you can see that means that they are not really very reliable, these predictions. Now what happens with the, the latest is the following. Uh, Dr. Sajni Rajendran at CMAX has analyzed the data for IPCC AR5 and what she reports is that for IPCC AR5 almost all the models are showing an increase except for one. I think she looked at 20 or 25 models. And the projections for the change of ISMR 2150 relative to the present vary from model to model with a slight increase for one model and increase for the rest. But the rate of increase of the ensemble average, again there is a huge spread in the rate of increase. Okay, So if one takes an ensemble average, it's not very meaningful because the spread is lot. But it is about 3% of the mean ISMR in the current. That is to say, in about now 30 years, the mean will increase by 3%, okay? Now, what it means, we have to see. Thus, as far as monsoon is concerned, the projections of climate models cannot be considered reliable. Recent results have enhanced this lack of reliability. And I think somebody may have talked in this course about the hiatus in global warming, have they? Have they talked about it? Yes. No? Yes. Yes? yes. What is the answer? Yes or no? It doesn't yes. matter. <laughs> As you know, this is a very, very interesting thing. What has happened is, and they say the biggest mystery in climate science today may have begun. Unbeknownst to anybody at the time, with a subtle weakening of the tropical trade winds blowing across the Pacific Ocean in late 97. So the winds across the Pacific, trades across the Pacific weakened since 97. These winds normally push sunbaked water towards Indonesia. When they slackened, the warm water sloshed back towards South America, resulting in a spectacular example of a phenomenon known as El Nino. I think people may have talked to you about El Nino? Yes. Good. Okay, average global temperatures hit a record high in 1998 and then the warming stalled. So this global warming about which we are harping so much is actually stalled for almost 10 years now. 98 to now, why almost 10, more than 10 years, 16 years. Okay, for several years scientists wrote off the stall as noise in the climate system the natural variations in the atmosphere, ocean, and biosphere that drive warm or cool spells around the globe. But the pause has persisted, sparking a minor crisis of confidence in the field. Although there have been jumps and dips, average atmospheric temperatures have risen little since 1998. In seeming defiance of projections of climate models and the ever-increasing emissions of greenhouse gases. So this is a very intriguing phenomena that has happened. As it is, it is difficult to trust climate proje projections over India because the models are so bad and there is so much scatter in the projection. On top of that, none of the models have been able to capture what has happened in the last two decades. Now this is very, very interesting. All that means is that uh, one has to take these projections with a very suitable large pinch of salt. Okay, but now can we learn anything from this? It appears that the major robust conclusion of climate change modeling studies of the IPCC AR4 and AR5 is that the frequency of extremes will increase. Okay, so you had a certain frequency of droughts and uh, excess monsoon rainfall years. So that frequency is going to increase with global warming because there is more energy in the system and so on and so forth. Now the point is, these extremes we are getting anyway, we are experiencing all the time. 
And so it appears that as far as Indian monsoon is concerned, if we can manage climate variability, if we can adopt strategies which are appropriate for the present day climate variability, climate change will take care of itself. This is my assertion. Is that clear what I'm saying? See, we talk of adaptation to climate change. Yes, you. Can we explain this? You want me to go back? No, no, this point is explained. You want me to ex expound on this? Yeah. See, what I'm saying is, you saw that interannual variation, no? And we had droughts and we had uh, excess monsoon season, right? With a certain frequency. Now, what most of the markets are saying is that the frequency of the extremes is going to increase with global warming. And this is a robust result. You know, in how much increase will occur in monsoon and all, it varies from model to model. But this is a robust result and it seems to have physical basis. This result. So the thing to do is when we talk of adaptation to climate change, isn't it? So the thing to do is how do we adapt to climate change? If you are thinking about the monsoon, I say look, if at all the models are right, then we should be guarded against more other extremes occurring more often than present day life, right? So we should adapt to the extremes. But extremes are not unknown to us. We know droughts, we know excess rainfall. So we should, so if we can adapt to the present day climate variable, if we can adapt to the extremes that we know, then climate change will take care of itself, right? We know nothing more about climate change than this fact. So the critical thing for adaptation and mitigation is extremes. And unfortunately, we have not adapted properly to the extremes in the present milieu. Traditionally, we had adapted, but in the present milieu, we have not. So, okay. Now, if you are interested, I want to go into the impact of monsoon on agriculture and GDP. Okay. Now, how has the agricultural production fared in the face of monsoon variability over the past six decades. I am saying that the monsoon variability is what we have to look at. So how has the agricultural production fared? When we have a huge gap, dips in the agricultural production in some years, doing well in others, and actually, agricultural production was okay up to about 19, and then it seems to have stagnated. The growth rate is not there. But you see the huge dips we get are all droughts. This is the famous 65, 66, this is 72, 74, 79, all are well-known droughts and so on. And this is the drought of 2009. So all droughts have a major impact on the food grain production. Note that the overall food grain production started increasing with the end of the colonial rule in the 50s and in association with the Green Revolution since the 70s. So because of the Green Revolution since 70s and initially also, even before the Green Revolution, food grain production has increased because of the government investment. See, colonial rule, there was no investment at all. With the, our getting independence, there was a lot of investment in irrigation facilities and so many other things. And lot of more land came under cultivation and with that the food grain production did increase. But they could not have sustained it then without the Green Revolution. So that is what, where the Green Revolution came in. However, the production of rainfed crops such as pulses, dals, which is critical for nutrition security, hardly increased over this period. And this is what you see here. So again, from the end of colonial rule now, this is the per capita food grain. So population was increasing, but food grain was increasing at a comparable rate. So per capita food grain availability remained very reasonable. But look at the per capita availability of dals. It has dropped to half of this. This is because it is a rain-fed crop. It is dependent on the monsoon. So this is very bad. And the first step in adaptation to climate monsoon variability is a quantitative assessment of the impact of critical resources such as food grain production and the overall economy GDP. So what we have done is actually try to assess what is the impact of the monsoon. Okay? And we look at All India scale. And I think I will go through this a little fast because we spent a lot of time in discussion in between. So 
This is, but I thought anyway it would be of interest because we read about this in newspapers all the time. This is the GDP. This paper came out in 2006. So the GDP is only up to that point. So earlier in the colonial, as soon as the colonial era ended, we started having growth. And this growth is at the rate of 3.5. Remember it's an exponential thing. So 3.5 is the so-called Hindu rate of growth. Now, what happened is because we had reforms then, from the 80s, the growth rate picked up to about 5.5. This is a long-term average thing, and you can see that that happened around 80. That's when the reforms and liberalization really began. Just to give the young people some perspective, this is the GDP. Now I have gone back to British Raj. Huh? And you see how the GDP was? Flat. This is the colonial exploitation. There was no question of GDP growth of the colony. It's only after independence that we started growing. This is the Hindu rate of growth, and this is after reform scheme. This is just to have a perspective on what's happening. Okay. Now what happens to food grain production? Again, we can fit curves. And it was 2.7% throughout. This is what I meant. So all the scientists can take credit for green revolution and they should. Equally good growth rate was obtained before by other means. Only thing is it could not have been sustained. And that is what the green revolution. But recently it has stagnated. See, it's not growing enough. So that's a very serious thing. So again for food grain production, just for the perspective, this is the colonial rate of growth which is very close to zero. And this is what was achieved after independence. Now, how do we calculate the impact? I don't want to go into it. What we get is, okay, GDP left to itself may grow in this way. Then we try and take the deviation from that and relate it to the events of that year. It could be war, but now we relate it to monsoon. Okay? So I don't want to get into details. You can refer to the paper if you want. But we have done a calculation, therefore, of what is the response of various things to the monsoon. In other words, we simply plot impact on food grain production, okay? This is related to the deviation of food grain production from that long period trend, okay? And we put here ISMR anomaly, all India monsoon rainfall anomaly. Minus means it's below average, plus means it's above average, okay? And this is the impact. First thing you see is it's highly non-linear. Impact of droughts is very, very high. Impact of food monsoon years is not at all compared. This is a very striking feature for food grain production. And same thing for GDP. This was a surprising result. We had not expected this. So again you have, you see, huge impact of droughts and relatively less impact of good monsoon years, even on GDP. This means that even if the monsoon didn't vary with climate change, huh, what you are losing in droughts, you cannot make up in the good rainfall years. There is something wrong with the strategies we are adopting. Okay, so the impact of the monsoon on FGP and GDP is highly nonlinear, with the magnitude of the impact of a negative ISMR anomaly being larger than that of a positive ISMR anomaly of the same magnitude. Thus, while deficits in monsoon rainfall have a large negative impact, the precipitation effectiveness of normal or surplus monsoon is not commensurate with the magnitude of the rainfall anomaly. Furthermore, and this was shocking, this asymmetry of the impact of the monsoon on food grains has increased in the last three decades. We wanted to see now after uh, post reforms, has there been any change? So we looked at things after 80 and before 80. So what we find is the following. Again, it's the same picture, but this is 1951 to 80, this is 81 to 2004. So 51 to 80, at least some years you have positive departure of, of food grain production. <laughs> 81 to 2004, similar variation in ISMR, but simply doesn't bring much increase in FTP. And you can see that here. See, droughts continue to have a huge impact. So 51 to 80 is minus 10 percent for minus 15 percent of the anomaly rainfall, and 81 to 0 is almost same, minus 8.6 percent. But if you look at positive 
rate per year. Then 15, <laughs> positive has 6% uh, above average in food grain production, but 0.73 after 80. Would it be different about the conventional agriculture land to some other uses? Pardon me? Would it be different about all the agriculture land being converted to you know, the same or any other? Lots of factors, no, no. Lots of factors are main, but this, what you say is not the major factor. I will come to the major factor. Okay, this implies that even, as I have said this before, so we have suggested, now what, what has led to the higher asymmetry? is the question. So what has happened since 80s? There has been a change in cropping systems and basically we have now practicing non-sustainable agriculture. Intensive agriculture leading to loss in the fertility of soils, monocropping over large areas leading to several pests becoming endemic and facilitating spread of diseases. So it is now not possible to get good yield even in good rainfall years without application of fertilizers and pesticides. You know, because of these huge monocrops and unsustainable use of the soil. This is the situation. So this is a result from ICRISAC, International Crop Research Institute for Semi-Arid Tropics. And what you see here is all are rainfed crops now. And this is the yield on the farmer's fields. And blue is the yield at the research station. At the same location, under the same agroclimatic conditions. Okay? So this is what you would get at the agricultural station. This is what the farmers get. This is famously called the yield gap. Yield gap is the difference between what could be obtained using the available technology to what is actually obtained. And since the technology is available, hopefully the yield gap can be crossed. Now why is the yield gap so large? And notice that the yield gap is very, very large for good rainfall. For poor rainfall, there is not too much difference between farmers and agricultural stations, okay? And you know, these people have done similar studies for umpteen crops in Ikrisak. All of them show the same pattern, absolutely. Now, why does the yield gap increase with seasonal rainfall? So, major difference in the management at agricultural stations and farms is application of fertilizers and pesticides. See, these do not increase yield in poor rainfall years. Because in poor rainfall years, the yields are low no matter what we do. In the absence of a reliable forecast of no drought, farmers do not consider them cost effective and hence do not invest in them at all. In any year, they don't invest in them. Although they have the know how to know how and do apply them over irrigated patches. So it's not a matter of lack of knowledge, but it's a conscious decision that the farmers make that it is not cost effective to invest in fertilizers and pesticides. This is a problem. Now, however, at agricultural station farm, farm economics is irrelevant, right? They get money from the government. So liberal doses of fertilizers and pesticides can be applied and yield can be enhanced. Of course, those are wasted during poor monsoon years, but so be it. In good monsoon years, they get good yield. So even then, the yields are not very much better than farmers' yields in poor rainfall years, which is why farmers do not apply them. However, in normal or good monsoon years, the yield enhancement due to this application is very large. Hence, the yield gap increases with seasonal rainfall. So now, this is the problem. This is why the asymmetry has come, and this is a major reason for the asymmetry. Because remember, the variability of food grain production comes primarily from the rain-fed crops. So this is something which is universal in India. So now how do we mitigate it? Now it is really foolish to adopt a strategy which is only good for droughts. What farmers are doing by abstaining investment in fertilizers and uh, pesticides is actually adopting a strategy which is appropriate only for droughts. And droughts don't occur every year, they occur only in a small fraction of years. So to increase the effectiveness of rainfall in the absence of droughts, it is necessary to adopt family farming strategies using the predicted frequency of occurrence or non-occurrence of drought. The prediction of extremes of monsoon is very important. And we at our center do have some methods of that, but I'm not going to go into that. But the least you can do, forget prediction, the least you can do is we have 100 years of rainfall data. We know the percentage of occurrences of drought, and this is for all India monsoon rainfall climatology. You see that only 25% of the years or so roughly droughts occur. 
75% of the years your strategy is inappropriate. So one can do clever statistics and you know make sure that the cost benefit ratio is correct so that you get advantage of normal and good monsoon years and only then will this asymmetry change. Otherwise you are going to be hit by droughts no matter what you do and you are not reaping the harvest from the good monsoon years. This is the whole problem and this is where I am afraid agricultural scientists have totally failed us because they are not used to looking at climate variability as a resource. They only try and go on producing drought prone seeds and so on. But droughts are not a phenomenon that happens every year. One in four, what are you doing in another three out of four years? See, this is the problem. So a lot of intelligent planning would be required before I take questions. Now, therefore, at this point, I think we've had a very long session. And so we, I will stop here. Uh, the conclusions from the climate change thing then seem to me that A, the present day climate models are very poor in simulating even the mean monsoon rainfall. Secondly, there is a huge divergence in projections, although the divergence has decreased from uh, IPCC AR4 to AR5. In AR4, a substantial number of models were showing decrease in rainfall, while a large fraction showed increase. In AR5, only one model is showing some decrease, rest are showing increase, but still the spread is enormous. So for whatever it is worth, one can take an ensemble average and think about it. Then there is the problem that bugs me is of the hiatus not being at all predicted by the climate model. But one thing robust that seems to have come out in with all the climate models is that the frequency of extremes is going to increase. So if I were to lay, take a lesson from all the climate change studies, it would be that please try and adapt to the maximum possible degree to the extremes in the present day climate. Because we don't expect extremes to be different in nature. They will occur more frequently, that's about it. And in do, to do so, we need to do some intelligent adaptation. And there is a lot of room for this kind of thing. So I'm going to stop here, because I think we have covered a lot of ground. And uh, now we can have questions for about five, 10 minutes. So that's right, here we have considered broad cases. But then excess years are also bad for crops. Excess rainfall years. So if we add broad and excess year, then what is the ratio? No, no. See, there are different. What you say is true. That excess meaning extreme excess. And that too, I noticed now that most of the damage to crops occurs not because of rainfall, but people who manage the reservoirs do not release the water, think that because they want to ensure that the reservoir will be 100% full every year. So they will not release the water even by taking probability of rainfall occurring beyond the stage or anything. They wait till that heavy rain event which fills the reservoir. And that event not only floods the system, but that is when they let out the water. So there is enormous waste to, you know, damage of crops caused by this kind of mismanagement. But on the whole, if you see, in the previous years, for example, before 80, also we had excess monsoon years. <coughs> but we did get, say for example, in the table I showed you, that if there is 15% excess rain, we will get 6% more yield, 6% more production. So it is very true because then the land was fertile, okay, and the limiting resource was rainfall. And we didn't have such large monocrops, you know, such large land and single crops. So pests were not such a problem. In that case, you can get good. It is not true that you get so much damage due to good monsoon. But what you are saying is our present day experience, partly also anthropogenic. I know. Can I have one more thing? Like, even if we See, what I'm saying is, the first decision is it should be based on zero error of prediction, which comes from probability of drought. Okay, so for example, if drought is probable only in 25% of the year, you decrease the dosage of the fertilizers and pesticides, the investment in them, and you integrate and see what, when is the cost benefit ratio favorable. See, you need not abstain from using any. You do it such that although there will be losses in drought years, they will be more than made up in all the years. That is the way to do it. Then comes the prediction of non that is why prediction of non-occurrence of drought is more important. If you can generate in that. 
because then they can invest in this and get good news. But <coughs> people are not even doing the zero thing that you should do to address the planet, to climate. This is <coughs> I think if I talk anymore, <laughs> my throat will go. So shall we stop the discussion at this point? Thank you.